والنعمة لك والملك So people often ask about what do we mean by the miqat uh, So miqat are boundary markers around the sacred city of uh, Makkah al-Mukarramah So those who live within Makkah al-Mukarramah they have their own uh, boundary markers they're called the hill but those who are afaqi these are people who are coming from uh, around the horizons from uh, around the world basically outside of Makkah al-Mukarramah they got set miqats and this is from the hadith of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam where the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he demarcated the five miqat points around Makkah al-Mukarramah so he spoke about muhallal ahl al-madina min dhul hulayfa so he says that the the miqat the boundary marker point for the people of Medina is Dhul Hulayfa, so a place where, so those people going on Hajj, if they uh, arrive in Medina al Manawara, when they're leaving Medina al Manawara, they will go to an area called Dhul Hulayfa and they'll go to the Abyar uh, Ali, uh, radiallahu anhu, where they will uh, go into their state of ihram, and the men, of course, will see that, like I'm wearing at the moment, their ihram clothes. Um, but the other four markers, um, Ahlu Sham, so for the people of Sham, so coming from the Levant area to the north of the, the Kaaba, they will take, they will assume their ihram from uh, Al Juhfa, which is a, an area near Rabigh. Um, then, as for the Ahl Yemen, the people of Yemen coming from the south, so the opposite direction, they will take their miqat from Yalamlam. Um, as for the uh, Ahl Najd, this is in the eastern provinces, the upland plateaus of modern day Saudi Arabia, they will take their miqat point from Qarn, but it's also known as Qarn Manazil in other riwayas. And finally, the, the Ahl al Mashriq. The people of the east, they will take their miqat from Dhat al-Irq. So this is people, especially these were new Muslim communities who became Muslims uh, in the, uh, what we would now know as the blessed lands of Iraq. The important point about this is that you are entering into the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is Malik al-Muluk. He's the king of kings. And we have to go in a set state, as you're seeing what I'm wearing right now, the ihram clothing, very simple for the men. It'll be two sheets, the top half, which is called the rida, and the bottom half, which is called the izar. And this is clothing that the Prophet ﷺ would wear. And you'll see in countless ahadith about the descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ that he would wear this, this form of clothing. And what's even more extraordinary than that is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak about how he says about himself. He says, he says, Ala iz izaruhu, that the might and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his izar. It's, it's, it's incredible that Allah will attribute in a manner which is befitting him an izar to himself. And he'll also talk about his rida as well. He'll speak about his upper garment, garment subhanahu wa ta'ala in a, in, in a means which is befitting to him as being his kibriya, his haughtiness his, and his power and majesty and greatness. So these are extraordinary. That's, so, you know, the ulama speak about this, the, these, the simple clothing that we wear. We're preparing to enter into the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which leads me on to finally uh, mentioning something about many people ask how many umrahs and how many hajjahs did the Prophet والسلام, actually do? The strongest opinion amongst the ulama is that the Prophet والسلام, he, he performed four umrahs. The first Umrah, many of you will re recall in the sixth year after Hijri, was uh, at the Sulh Hudaybiyah, where the Prophet ﷺ came with many of the companions, came from one of the Makkah Miqat points, which was Hudaybiyah, with the intention of performing the Umrah. The Makkans unfortunately stopped this ha from happening, and then there was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, but the scholars will count that as number one, based on the intention. Number two is the one year following, because the treaty said that they, the Muslims can come back the following year and perform the Umrah. So a year later, again, in the holy month of Dhul Ka'adah, the Prophet ﷺ comes with 2,000 of his companions, 200 of whom are, are, are armed as well, just as a precaution. But, and then they will perform their, their Umrah. And this was called the Umrah al-Qadha. This is the Umrah which made up for the one that was from the previous year. The third Umrah that the Prophet ﷺ will perform is after the Battle of Hunayn, where he will come to the other Miqat boundary marker of Ji'rana, and he will perform the, the Umrah. And finally, of course, the fourth and final Umrah of the Prophet ﷺ is Hajjat al Wida'a, when the Prophet ﷺ comes for his final pilgrimage. And as we said earlier, the, this is the Hajj al Qiran combining the Umrah with the Hajj. This is the fourth and final time the Prophet ﷺ will perform Umrah, which opens the final point. How many times did the Prophet ﷺ actually perform Hajj? SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ performed one solitary Hajj. This is what was termed even at, his, at that time in the 10th year after Hijri as Hajjatul Wida'a. It was the, had, the farewell Hajj. But again, before any of us says, this must have been a clear indication to the 124,000 companions who were present at that Hajj that this was the Prophet Wada'anna saying farewell to the people and that they, they were fully aware that the Prophet ﷺ within two months would pass away. 
the reality is, brothers and sisters, it was a huge shock to all of the companions and certainly continues to be a shock to this ummah when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, actually passed away. But it is referred to in our history, of course, as Hajjatul Wida'a, the farewell pilgrimage.